let me preface everything that we say here today by saying that I don't know what Smurf and Stone container has in mind for the facility during the next six months, six years, 16 years. But I know this, that this community depends on those jobs that have been at Smurf and Stone container for some period of time. If their plan is they're done with our community, I can promise you this, we are not done in this community. We will grow out of the past of Smurf and Stone container. Today, we have some folks that will be talking about some potential opportunities. In much the same way that we have been looking at green energy in eastern Montana, mostly around wind power, transmission, wind farms, we've been working during the last few years developing a relationship with companies that are likely to produce energy with biomass. And of course, as long as Smurfit Stone Container has been a sink for those wood chips and that waste material that was coming from the timber industry in western Montana, many of the people who were looking at biomass, thinking about biomass, who are planning biomass projects, they've continued to think and plan because there was a disposition of those chips. If Smurf at Stone Container does not plan to use those chips in the future, we think that there's some real opportunities in treating other manufacturing, other green manufacturing, and in particular producing energy with the biomass. Make no mistake about it, finding a use for those chips affects more than just Smurf at Stone Container. There's 6,000 jobs and more that are dependent on finding a use for wood chips here in western Montana. The timber jobs, including the loggers, the people who have been sawing, those people who have been trucking, uh, those people who are in the construction business around the timber industry, uh, they will not succeed unless we have a place to use those chips. Now, today, we are going to hear from a few folks who have some ideas. And uh, listen, it's, uh, it's not our first rodeo. We've been talking about these ideas for some period of time. There have been people planning in case this day would come with Smurfit. And some of those people are here today. We're going to actually uh, hear from some of them. We're going to hear from McKinstry. Street. Talk Tim Tolman is going to talk to us a little bit about some of their ideas for business development. Uh, they are a Montana company that has uh, been creating opportunities in the energy space, mostly around energy conservation, but they do business elsewhere in design and development of energy production. We're going to hear from Northwestern Energy. Bob Rowe is here, which means a heck of a lot. You know, Bob, there was a time that when uh, the uh, headquarters uh, over there in South Dakota, we barely saw the people that were running Northwestern Energy, but now that we have a Montanan, Again, running Northwestern Energy, about every place I go, Bob is there. So, <laughs> No, I'm not getting sick of you. You've been a great partner. And, and uh, might I say that uh, since Bob Rowe has become the, the CEO, is that what you are? Are you the CEO? <laughs> since he's become the CEO, they've also become a partner in development of green energy across Montana. And that wasn't always the case with Northwestern Energy, so I appreciate your efforts. So we'll hear from Bob in a little bit. Um, we're going to, uh, we're also going to hear from John Ottman from Ottman Consulting, and then we're going to end uh, hearing from Craig Wilkins from Zinc Air. But for right now, we're going to start with Tim Tolman from uh, McKinstry. So, take her over. Thank you, Governor. Look across the, the front of the room, uh, in particular, you'll see uh, my director of DNRC is here. Uh, the Director of Commerce is here, the Director of Labor is here, my Chief Economic Officer, uh, the members from our Energy Office. This is important to us and we want to get it right. This morning we met with Labor and we said to them, look, uh, we want to help you as you go through this maze of unemployment benefits and things called COBRA and there are things that uh, you will decide during the coming months that will affect your family for the coming years. And so we want to help you get it right. I see we have a number of legislators here. Uh, 
we have uh, Senator Wanzenry sitting all the way in the back. I don't know, if, uh, maybe he thought it was uh, the, the, the shooting to break out here, but uh, give him a wave here, Dave. There we go. And I see uh, Senator Williams is up front here, and her, uh, her driver and the uh, bottle washer and chief cook, uh, Pat Williams, is here as well. <laughs> I, I see that uh, uh, Senator Tester has been a very good partner in all of this, and Bill Lombardi, who is the state director, is here. Um, and I, I noticed that Gordon Hendricks is here. He's a great legislator and, and has been through this as the mayor of a town that, that, lost, that lost a mill. Dave McAlpin is right over here. Give, give a wave there, Dave. And as we go forward, we'll mention a few other people. Um, not seated, seated at the front of the table is, uh, is a company that will be a partner in any of our recovery efforts. Uh, the Washington Corporation is uh, a big part of this community. Mike Halligan is sitting right up front here. And, uh, I think it doesn't matter uh, what it is that we do, uh, we're all going to be working uh, with the Washington Corporation. So now I'm going to uh, kick this over to Bob Rowe. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a very good partner, and uh, I've, uh, I've started to become a fan of Northwestern Energy as opposed to where I was a few years ago, so Bob Rowe. <laughs> situations where the, the son or the daughter of someone who's been a prominent politician has become successful. Uh, they make it on their own merit, but basically they've got that name recognition. But it's, it was a very odd turn of events here in Missoula when Kevin Fury got elected to the legislature. And uh, of course, he also has uh, been serving uh, our country and served in Iraq. And when he was called to Iraq, um, it, it offered an opportunity for his father to get into politics, so Representative Tim Fury is here. Uh, the reverse nepotism. Uh, and I see Representative Sue Malik back there. And give a, give a wave. Senator Cliff Larson is here as well. Representative Teresa Henry. And uh, of course, uh, Senator Carolyn Squires, uh, whenever she gets an opportunity, she gets a hold of me right here, and she gets done what she wants to get done, and she's here today. And, and, and thank you again for getting me squared away, Senator. Uh, but Senator Ron Erickson is here today. And, I, and, I, and I've got to tell you this story. Uh, about two months before the legislative session, I started having conversations with Senator Erickson. He had, a, he had an idea that uh, Montana ought to have a carbon dioxide law. He said, look, uh, there's going to be opportunities. We, we have a great deal of coal here. Uh, as as we start regulating CO2, we, we need to have certainty in our laws. We don't today. A landowner or a, a geology owner, uh, they don't know whether they have the right to sequester CO2. And so he proposed some legislation in, that was uh, really uh, groundbreaking for the entire country. And he arrived with high hopes, and I was excited about it. And he proposed his legislation, and uh, the Republicans on his committee killed him. And they announced to the world they don't even believe in this uh, phony baloney global warming and all the rest of it. That's a, and it, it was dead, dead and gone. And uh, he continued to work on it. Some other folks continued to work on it. And we managed to bring that legislation back from the dead several times. And Senator Erickson, while your name wasn't on the legislation, you are the one who delivered that bill for Montana. I have something to tell you today. I had some uh, people come in to visit with me who have already begun actively tying up the rights to store CO2 in eastern Montana. They've invested $12 million quietly already to acquire the rights to 200,000 acres in and around the Porcupine Dome, which is one of the uh, most likely places to store CO2. Um, it's uh, straight north of Coal Strip, and it is straight west of the Bakken uh, oil shale, and so as we deplete the oil, we will have stored the CO2 in the dome, and we can pump it back out of the dome into these oil fields and increase oil production in eastern Montana while we are permanently sequestering CO2. Senator Erickson, thank you for thinking about the future. We, uh, we've had some great successes in, in Montana in making our buildings more energy efficient. You heard a little bit about it earlier. It was, it was uh, comforting for us that after uh, Barack Obama was elected president of the United States and they started talking about some ideas of making the buildings in this country more energy efficient. And then a year and a half earlier, 
we had proposed something that's uh, 20 by 10, which was to make the state-owned buildings in Montana more energy efficient and actually decrease our energy consumption by 20% by the year 2010. And the Obama administration asked us um, about how this was progressing and when they passed the Recovery Act, they actually included uh, some of the principles that we've been using in Montana. So that when these recovery dollars came to Montana, we were ready on the ground because our schools and our state buildings had already begun our energy inventories and we were a year or two years ahead of the rest of the states. Now, today we're going to hear from John Ottman, who uh, is a, a consultant in the Jumpstart program, and he'll tell you more about that and other things. Thank you very much. Come on up here. <laughs> a couple of them for the end on purpose. A few years ago, a uh, young lady from Livingston talked to me and said, uh, you know, I've been thinking about uh, running for the legislature um, from Livingston, but I've been going to school in Missoula and I'm torn which place to run from. And uh, it was Missoula's gain and Livingston's loss when Michelle Reinhardt decided that she would be a legislator representing the people of Missoula. Thank you for serving, Michelle. Um, and uh, uh, Mayor Ingen, I see uh, he has been an advocate for JAG right the way along. While he's got departments and he's got do-gooders around here in Missoula, they're always after JAG. The mayor personally has said that if it comes to that level, uh, he has a pardon. Is that still? Thank you very much, Mayor. I appreciate that. Uh, and while I've mentioned Bill Lombardi is here, I didn't mention that Dana Swanson is here, so she's also with uh, Senator Tester. And... Uh, I, I thought uh, that I should, uh, I should say this in Missoula, and I should say it loud and proud, and that is uh, that you all know that I'm a bobcat, but I'm going to tell you how proud I was of the Grizzlies, 14 and 0, playing in the national championship. Uh, those kids, those men on that team represented every single Montanan and uh, what the final score was in Chatt Chattanooga wasn't the one that I wanted, but I am very proud of the Grizzlies, the University of Montana, that football team, and probably the greatest coach in the history of Montana, Bobby Howe. So I'll just get that out there right now. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Keith Kelly. He is the Director of Department of Labor. We spent a great deal of time with uh, people who have been laid off at the mill this morning, but. Uh, Keith is going to talk just a little bit about uh, when there's spillover effects. If you have a small business and you have layoffs, uh, if you have reduction in your business because what has happened at Smurford Stone, there's also benefits that could be available to you. So we're going to uh, we're going to ask Keith Kelly to come and talk about that a little bit. <coughs> Arrived uh, on the West Coast and went to work for the Hearst family, and was somewhat successful there. And, made enough money so he could go out on his own and he worked his way uh, through a lot of the other mining districts and ultimately ended up in Helena. And a lot of the miners who came, the hard rock miners in the early days, so they didn't have skills in geology or mining engineering, they just kind of uh, like a squirrel looking for nuts, you know, they beat a hole inside of the mountain if they hit a gold vein while they were rich, if not they went home and most of them went home. But this, uh, this guy actually did have skills, his name was Thomas Cruz, and he uh, he mapped out uh, many different areas in the Helena district and then he was near uh, the present town of Marysville and he saw a quartz outcrop coming out of the top of the mountain. With some calculations and some assumptions and he assumed that if he were to bore in a quarter mile at certain uh, depth that he might be able to intersect this quartz body that had a lot of gold in it. And sure enough, Thomas Cruz struck gold and it was the richest gold deposit in the history of Montana. And uh, so the Drum Lumen Mine was uh, started, and he made a, a great deal of money. In 1898, he sold it to a German engineering company who mined it for a few more years, and uh, his attention turned to his daughter. And he went to the, the new bishop uh, in Helena, and he said to him um, that he would like him to build a grand cathedral, um, and he would give him the money to build that cathedral. And so on that day, he gave the money to build a cathedral that was to have four spires, and was to be exactly 20 times larger than the, uh, the cathedral he remembered in Ireland. And less than a year later, the bishop came back to him and he said, Mr. Cruz, if you want to build a cathedral that big, we will do it. 
But frankly, 100 years from now, there won't be enough people living here that would you know, justify having a cathedral that large. And, and while you have a dream for your daughter to be married in this grand cathedral when she's old enough, and that's why you gave me the money, I also have a dream. I am an educator, but the, the Holy Father, he sent me here to Helena, and uh, there's, frankly, not much of an opportunity for me to be an educator. So if you would agree, I would like to use half of the money to build a college, and we would use the other half, and we will build a cathedral easily grand enough and large enough for the next hundred years, and we'll have two spires. So it was on that day that it was decided the cathedral would have only two spires, and Bishop Carroll got his wish and started a college. Now, it got even better here a few years ago. Some uh, Canadian miners came into my office, and they said, well, you know, we were up at Virginia City in Bannock, and we had a geologist who works for us, and he thought that some of these quartz bodies uh, hadn't been fully exploited 100 years ago. And so we were buying mining patents in Virginia City and, and Bannock uh, from folks who owned it. And one old timer said, well, if you're looking for gold, why don't you buy the drum woman? Well, we didn't have any idea what the drum woman was, but he talked it up like it was something big, and they bought it for almost nothing. And uh, they decided the plan for the drum woman is they would go all the way in to where the German company ran out of gold in 1906, and they would drill uh, a core 3,000 feet straight ahead and 2,000 feet in both directions and 1,000 feet down, 1,000 feet up. And so they drilled a, a one and a half inch core 280 feet beyond where the German company had quit 100 years ago, and they hit a bigger quartz body with three ounces uh, per ton which uh, is even richer than what they were mining in the early days in the drum woman. And now they're reopening the mine, as Keith has just mentioned, with 300 employees. And uh, along the way, this is a rich enough body that there'll be no cyanide leach. They can mine gold without it. So that's a success story in Montana that goes back a lot of years. Uh, at this time, I'd like to open it up to uh, some questions. We have some great experts here. We have in the front row uh, directors uh, from all of the agencies that matter in state government. So if there's an easy question, of course I'll answer it. Uh, if there's a question that's tougher, I have experts. So please, and we have we have a microphone here um, for any and one up front as well. And uh, Mayor Ingen, I would uh, I would ask that you uh, you start because this is after all your city. Uh, and you, uh, of course, have offered a pardon for Jay. So uh, I, you would uh, just uh, welcome the people here, and uh, it's great to be in your city. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate your efforts today. Uh, we had a conversation last week, Governor, and, and your staff was enormously helpful there. Uh, this is less a question, oddly enough, than a statement, because you know what I do for a living, too. Um, we're going to need to continue help pushing Smurfit for answers, and we're going to need some help um, understanding what we can do to turn the corner, especially as we continue our conversations uh, such as they are with bankruptcy court. Um, I, from my perspective, it is not acceptable for that plant to be mothballed. It's not acceptable for it to sit there. So folks from Missoula and around the state um, and our, our federal partners, we need to continue to apply the pressure we need to apply wherever appropriate and however appropriate to ensure that that community resource and frankly that state resource is available to Missoulians, folks from Missoula County, and Montanans. So your efforts would be enormously appreciated and thanks for being here today driving the train. Thanks again to your staff. We really appreciate their efforts as well. Got a lot of people here who are, who are willing to to uh, step up, we're not victims in Missoula. We're we're folks who get stuff figured out. Thanks. Well, thank you, and and believe me, um, we consider this uh, an adver an adversity to be sure, but an opportunity, and, and that's what we're talking about here today is opportunities. But we are we are ready to take any questions uh, from anybody to anybody. So uh, help yourself, Governor Mike, please. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for coming here today. My name is Jim Birchfield. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. And I want to say right now on behalf of the college, and I believe I can speak for the university, I see Vice President Dan Dwyer, Dean Larry Guy and Chet of the Business School, Director of Alumni Relations, Bill Johnston. And I think I'm safe to say to us that the University of Montana supports the reopening of this facility and the use of this facility for the benefit of the university and the people here. 
Uh, I have committed all the available research resources that we have at the college to be able to understand the utility of biomass, how we might deal with mountain pine beetle. I want to thank John Ottman for uh, his support of our school. And I commit right now that the students and faculty of the University of Montana at the College of Forestry will be working to make sure we can keep our wood products industry vital. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, if you could, uh, I'd like you to work a little bit harder uh, between now and March. We'd like to find a solution for the, the mountain pine beetle. So thank you. <laughs> well, you just deal with that weather, uh, Governor, and, and uh, that'll be just fine. So what, what you really want is you want some of that uh, 20 degree below stuff, and you want it in March when the larva is a little bit larger and susceptible. Is that right? You got it. Okay, I'm in charge of the weather, so I'll get on that. What else? Please. I'd like to know if, uh, on uh, converting stone into a, a biomass 75 watt facility, how many jobs would that uh, create? Repeat right. the question, please. Yeah, never mind. Oh, you bet. I, uh, how yeah. many jobs would a 75 watt uh, plant, biomass plant? Yes, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, timber and biomass, uh, but we also want to talk about talk technology. Uh, University of Montana will continue to produce uh, great technologists and we want to continue to attract technology companies to come to Montana. So we're going to hear from Craig Wilkins from Zinc Air talk about some of the projects that they're working on. Thank you. Uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe had been acquired by Warren Buffett. He'd owned 25 percent and he decided to just buy the rest of it. And so uh, I thought well I better meet this guy because now everything we ship into Montana and everything we ship out of Montana is going to be through Warren Buffett. So I went down to Omaha to, to meet with him, called ahead, he said, oh yeah, come on in. And of course, uh, he's worth $60 billion and uh, he doesn't have his own building. He, uh, he rents his offices from Peter Kiewit Construction. So I got to his office and I think he has 12 people working for him, total, $60 billion company. He has a 14-year-old Buick that he drives to work, still lives in the same house he's lived in for the last 40 years. So I, uh, I said to him, uh, well, Warren, uh, this is a remarkable career. And he said, well, you know, Brian, I got my start uh, at J.C. Penney's. And he said it was my first job, my wife, and they put me in uh, uh, men's apparel. And I'd been there a couple of days, and I went back to the sales manager, and I said to him, uh, I, I sure appreciate this opportunity, but I have to be honest with you, I, I, I'm going to have to resign. Why, Warren? We were just getting to like you. Well, he said, uh, you know, I'm in men's apparel, and uh, i got to be completely honest with you, I don't know anything about it. I mean, when I get dressed and come down for breakfast, my wife says, you can't wear that to work. It doesn't match, and my, and my pants are too short, uh, my cuffs aren't long enough. Uh, and so, uh, what do I tell these people when they come out of that little room? You know, they put on a jacket, they come out of the little room, and they say, well, how's it look? Well, I have to be honest with them, don't I? I mean, how, how would I know how it looks? Because I don't even know how I look. So, he said, Warren, I don't worry about that. I've been doing this for a lot of years. Uh, when they come out, it isn't your opinion that really matters. You just have to say something. So, when they ask, you tell them, well, it looks good. And just either great or good, and they'll be happy, it just comforts them. They've already looked at themselves in the mirror, they know what they want to buy. Okay, good, great, Warren said, okay, I can do that. What's that, Warren? I don't know anything about manufacturing of clothes. I don't, I don't know what good material is, bad material, and oftentimes they'll ask me, well, what's, what's the jacket made of? And I haven't any idea. I mean, I, I don't know these things. Warren, don't worry about that. When they ask what the jacket's made of, you tell them, it's made of the finest Worcester, and just grab the sleeve. You see, that's why I can't stay here on this job. I don't know what Worcester is. Warren, there is no Worcester. And for 20 years I've been telling people it's the finest Worcester, and men are not going to ask you what is Worcester because, well, that's the way men are. So Warren said, three and a half years later, I was the best salesman that that J.C. Penney's store had ever had. I asked him about the railroad. Why the railroad? I've always liked trains. Ever since I was a kid, I, I've liked trains. But he's a smart guy. He, he bought that railroad for more than that. He said publicly that he bought that train 
He bought Burlington Northern Santa Fe because you can't make a better bet on America than buying Burlington Northern Santa Fe. And he said, America is coming back and I want to haul it. And that's what Burlington Northern Santa Fe is. Now we're going to get to batteries. I asked him about BYD. Berkshire Hathaway, his company, had bought a, a big interest in a Chinese battery manufacturer who now is the largest electric car manufacturer in the world, a company by the name of BYD, Google it. And uh, since he's bought it, it's increased in value six, sixfold. But he said that when his partner uh, went over to, when Charlie went over to meet with this uh, scientist in China, he came back and his partner, Charlie, is always the pessimist in the group. Usually he's the one that said it'll never work. Every single company we've ever bought, Charlie said, don't do it. He came back from China and he said, this guy's a genius. Uh, this Chinese engineer is the Thomas Edison of our day. Uh, so I can tell you two things about uh, Warren Buffett. He believes that the future of the Western Hemisphere is built on batteries. It's storage technology. He understands that we have an unlimited capacity of producing energy with wind and solar and other energy sources. We have a finite capacity of storing it, and those who control the storage control the future, and that's what Zinc Air is all about. So, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> what else? Uh -huh.